know, when you were in the job search, uh, negotiating is was something that a lot of people don't realize. I mean, in addition to being able to tell your story, and you went through the interview process with a bunch of other companies and got a bunch of other offers. So can you kind of unpack that for the people that are in the job search right now? Yeah. So, you know, I am going to correct you. It wasn't a bunch of offers. It was two. Uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there were other companies that I was in the process with, yeah. and I chose to drop out. So I think it's very possible that I would have had more yeah. more offers if I had had stuck those out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when it came down to the last two companies, what I did was I told MailChimp that um, that if they were willing to uh, drastically increase my um, my signing bonus, mm -hmm. that I would sign with them immediately yep. and I wouldn't like continue to try and like negotiate. Yeah. So that was that was a strategy that I chose, and I actually got that advice from um, Jill Wetzler, who works okay. at yeah. Uh, Lyft. Yeah. And she is someone who I had actually reached out to during my job search. Yep. During my job search, um, she she doesn't usually respond to people who reach out to her on LinkedIn, but she responded to me. I went wow. to her office. We talked, um, and we've been in touch ever since. Amazing. And so wow. her and she's a she's a director of engineering yeah. at at lyft um did so she, she did she see your campaign i believe she did yeah, yeah. and i i think she shared it and i think i don't know if she donated money or That's what amazing. but i yeah. know that she she saw it and she helped to share it yeah dope dope love it the power of the community um and so i think an, another common theme throughout your process um not just like during the job search but like for all the way from the beginning is the way you've told your story um you know people have taken chances on you because of your story um people have you know not just taken chances like some people believed in you because of your story supported you because of your story so can you talk about how you've essentially presented yourself i think you've obviously got a lot of training as a teacher um but yeah how, how do people why should people um uh, focus on telling their stories as engineers yeah, absolutely. I think I think having a story is really important, particularly if you are of a non-traditional background, because if you're switching in from a different career, you're already at a disadvantage and the average company is going to look at you and say, why should I choose you over this college grad who has done an internship or two or three um, or a, just another like mid-level engineer? And so you really have to um, you really have to sell yourself and make it clear that your lack of like technical abilities um that sorry the things that you bring to the table are greater or more significant than your lack of technical abilities mm -hmm. that the lack of technical abilities <coughs> is minuscule in comparison to everything else that you can bring to the table and that developing that technical skill is just gonna happen if you have the support and the yep. mentorship that you need, mm -hmm. but that there are all these other things that you've already spent years uh, developing and that that's, that's really what you bring to the table. And I think that in a lot of ways, I think that that's what MailChimp saw in me. Yeah. yeah. And you also, I mean, just to kind of go back to your background, you were a teacher, like you're, mm -hmm. you were leading a classroom of 12 year olds who don't want to respond well to authority and mm -hmm. you have to always keep them in line. And yeah. uh, there, I'm sure there's a lot of similarities of that in a work environment where you're also working with others and you have deadlines, you want to come up with a plan. Um, what was interesting is um, throughout this whole uh, process, you kept referring to the formula. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk a lot about on the podcast around what people do to succeed but can you break it down to the people listening? What is that formula and what will help them break into tech? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to keep this as succinct as possible. But I think the first step is to definitely have a plan. Okay. You know, the plan doesn't have to be perfect. You can update it over time. But do your research, do thorough mm -hmm. research and come up with some semblance of a plan that involves a time period and that involves... Uh, uh, a, a savings goal and also a savings plan so you know how much money you need to save how are you going to get there what are the things that you need to cut out of your lifestyle in order for you to be able to save the money that you need to save um 
I think the next thing is I is identifying people that can help you and resources that can help you along the way. I know that for me, the Breaking in Startups podcast was absolutely crucial because that podcast was able to give me insight, information, advice, strategy, even negotiating strategy. Like there's so much information that I got from that podcast. And, you know, you may be listening to a podcast and you hear some advice. You're not going to use that advice necessarily right in that moment but a situation may come up in Mm -hmm. five months Mm -hmm. and you'll remember what you heard from this one person's story on the podcast and that's where it becomes important and so exposing yourself to knowledge on a i listen to your podcast every day (laughs) in the morning on the way to work um in the gym while i was working out (laughs) like if i'm cooking dinner at night like i listen to it all day And I just took in as much information as I could. Um, So, and I also found other podcasts too. Like I listened Mm -hmm. to Code Newbie. Yeah, it's great. Shout Um, out to Swan. Yeah. So, so you know, there there were others as well. Um, So, so yeah. So, so finding that information, exposing yourself to that information, also helps to keep you motivated Mm -hmm. because you. It's not an easy process. So. You know, and it's gonna. There are gonna be times where you might feel burnt out, or you might doubt yourself, or yeah. question your ability. You yeah, get yeah. to, you know, mm-hmm. JavaScript like loops or yeah. functions or something <laughs> like that, and you're like, I don't get it. I don't understand. You know, having other people's stories playing in your head, you know, throughout the day helps to keep help to keep me motivated. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the next thing is is deciding that you're going to work very hard yeah um especially once the boot camp starts the boot camp is a very short amount of time you have to take full advantage every moment that you waste um not doing your homework assignments or going out to like drink or party with your classmates is information that you that you're losing that you may need when you're in your job hunt yeah um And so, you know, I think it's important to just go into the boot camp saying like this program is nine weeks. I'm going to bust my ass for these entire nine weeks or 18 weeks or whatever. Just give it everything that you can. It's such a it's a sprint. Boot camps are not marathons. They are sprints. You just got to sprint your ass off. Yeah. And if you can if you can sprint and give it everything, then you will graduate that boot camp in the top of your program. And when you go and you interview with people, they will be able to say, you know, this person is not just like, you know, half the other boot camp grads that we interviewed Mm -hmm. that we could tell just like skated through. You know, we can tell that this person took it seriously, um, did their homework, was committed and that this is someone that we want to invest in yeah yeah Yeah. can Uh, you uh so can you just break it down to the folks uh how your life has changed now that you've gone through this journey and you've made all these sacrifices how has your life different now than it was a year and a half ago yeah so my life is very different um when i was living in south florida i lived with my parents and the income that i was making was not was Enough that I I may have been able to f- live on my own, but I pro- I would have had to have a roommate or something like that, and I wouldn't have had much money like after I paid all of my expenses to do anything yeah. really. Um, so the difference is that now I'm fully independent from my parents um, and and from anyone. I am able to take care of myself financially. I'm able to. Um, my partner moved out here. Um, awesome. left his job to come move out here and stay here. So I'm able to support him financially. Um, I'm able to save for the future. Yeah. Um, I'm able to invest like yeah. there's, you know, there, there's just so much that I, I wouldn't have been able to do, mm-hmm. um, if I had stayed with the income that I had as a teacher, I would have just had to like stay living with my parents. Yeah. yeah. And then I think the other thing that's interesting too is you probably had a lot of people reaching out to you to, you know, also want to learn how to code. Can you talk about that? I think you've even helped my brother. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I probably have someone reach out to me maybe every other week or so. Um, different people that I know will like refer people to me. I try and speak to everyone that I can and, you know, I think it's very fulfilling because I was once in the same position yeah. not too long ago. So um, I think, 
you know, if, if anyone has any questions or they want advice or they want to hear more details about my story, uh, I'm happy to yeah. talk and, and help. Yeah. Yeah. And in our community, there are a lot of teachers and uh, I, I want to cover this subject because there's some professions where people go from being like a mechanical engineer to becoming a software engineer. So the transition is pretty logical, but we've seen a lot of success teachers have becoming software engineers. Can you talk a little bit about what that process is like from going from teaching to software engineering and also what were some of the advantages that you had uh, going through this process? Yeah. Advantages I had as a teacher. Yeah. Hmm. Or in general, what are some? Because uh, we talk about perceived disadvantages and yeah. advantages. <laughs> what were those? What were some of those for you? And and I just want I know we're asking like a like three questions in one, but like my sister is a teacher as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know we think a lot about like impact, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's able to impact her classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times we talk about engineering as a superpower, and like you know what we learn from our kids. And I've been a teacher as well as a music teacher. I used to teach cello, mm -hmm. and so like. Teaching that classroom was cool, but like, am I able to teach people at scale, mm -hmm. like in a short amount of time in my lifetime, and see that impact? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what like what what is the advantage or the perceived disadvantage or advantage that you had earlier, and like how has your perspective changed now that you are an engineer? Yeah. So I think the thing that I the thing that I got from teaching, I think there's two things. One is that having to teach students who have different ways of learning um, allowed me to better understand what I needed to do in order to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a student who you've explained a concept to or you've shown them a concept and they don't get it, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the times what students will do is they will give up or they will assume that they can't get it. They have a, um, they, they, they have a, what is it called? They don't have a growth mindset, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I think having the experience of seeing my students do that mm -hmm. allowed me to understand the ways in which I did that in my own life. And, you know, if I'm telling my student that, like, you just have to, you know, you just have to work at it. You just have to, you know, repeat, re re repetition, repetition, practice, practice, and you'll get it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think... I think the process of teaching that to to students allowed me to teach that to myself. Mm -hmm. um, also, one of the things that I did with my students, because I worked in a I worked in a school where it was a low income school where a lot of my students were just very, um, very jaded mm -hmm. and um, and had a hard time uh, learning the material or even being interested in in school, period. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I did was I would play motivational videos. It, we would have motivational Monday and every Monday I would play some sort of motivational video. Mm -hmm. And I remember I'd be sitting and I'd be watching the video and I'd be like, man, he's talking about me. And yeah. I'm like, <laughs> and this is, this is while I was like going through my own process yeah. of, of studying and like preparing to, to mm -hmm. come into the boot camp. And so, um, I just think teachers have so much, um, they have so much knowledge, mm -hmm. not like like actual like knowledge about like history and things like that, but so much knowledge about how to get people, how to motivate people mm -hmm. and how to teach people mm -hmm. and how to encourage people. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have a teacher who becomes an engineer and then becomes a mid-level or a senior engineer um, who's now a mentor, mm -hmm. you're going to have an extremely strong mentor. And I think and I think that that's something that that. Um, Melchimp saw in me, and I and I gave very specific examples yeah. during my interview process. Yes. Yeah, and I think that that's a great segue into you know the social justice stuff. But one more thing about teachers, because I was just in Ohio at the National Urban League Conference um, for talking about Save Our Cities um, and preparing for the digital revolution. And one of the teachers was so inspired by the talk and the future of work um, that they were excited but also concerned about how traditional education is changing. And a question that they ask as a teacher is, as a teacher that's trying to prepare kids for the future, or just people for the future in general, how do teachers know what to teach? Mm -hmm. So like, as a teacher, what advice would you give teachers about what to teach to prepare kids, adults, et cetera, for the future? Yeah, so it's hard because as a teacher, you have a curriculum and you have standardized testing 
and I think it's it's extremely restricting, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think the best thing that you can do is help kids understand um, the world that they live in and what is needed to be able to survive in that world mm -hmm. um, and help them understand that the skills that they learn, um, it doesn't have to be skills that they learn in school. It could be yeah. skills that they learn outside of school, yep. but that everything that they're learning needs mm -hmm. it, it needs to somehow be able to help them in the future and if it doesn't feel like it's going to help you like don't waste your time on it yeah. i think another thing that teachers um are doing more is project-based learning our mm -hmm. kids are hands-on learners yeah. a lot of them do not care about reading mm -hmm. a 200 page book yeah. you know like it's just it it's just not it's just not the world that we live in mm -hmm. they yeah. are they need visuals they need graphics they mm -hmm. need images they yeah. need experiences you need yeah. to take them places yeah. show yeah. them things and um but that's something that needs to be that needs to be implemented on like a, a like a like a massive scale yeah. a mass scale yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i think that yeah. makes a lot of sense and and for you know the people that that don't recognize um the 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 tie between education and social justice and organizing and uh creating leaders i think it's important for you to unpack that because you know while we we're at the urban league we connected with tiffany lofton from the naacp we talked about people in social justice also trying to get prepared for that digital future. You were at, you know, the Alliance, recognizing that there was inefficiencies. You discovered MailChimp and recognized the importance of tech to make things more efficient. So, you know, what is social justice? People talk about it as a buzzword, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unpack that. And what's that influence into, you know, what you're doing today, even with your own podcast? Yeah, yeah. So social justice is really about... Um, is about creating a world that's more equitable mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It's creating a world that is more fair, where people have a fair shot, where they're treated fairly, um, where their lives have equal value, mm -hmm. right? Where you don't have some people whose values are, whose lives are valued up here and other people whose lives are valued, you know, way, way down at the bottom. Yeah. Um, it's about, it's about closing that gap. And there's so many different ways that you can close that gap. I mean, you know, veterans are mistreated. People with disabilities are mistreated. Um, people of certain races and ethnicities and, and genders and gender identities. Like there's so, there's so many gaps in yeah. how people are treated. And so I think anyone who's advocating for fair and equal treatment um, that's based on Real justified research, yeah, not fake news, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> alternative facts, not alternative facts. <laughs> um, like you are, you are essentially fighting for social justice. Got it, got it. Yeah. yeah. What uh, about? So I have a question for you. So, how how, how has this transition and um, you learning how to code made you uh, more powerful as an organizer? Yeah, yeah. So I think that I think. So I actually wouldn't call myself an organizer anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, there's different types of activists, and I think it's important to make that clear. Community organizers are a type of activist. Mm -hmm. They are people who go out and get a community of people to organize around a specific cause and um, mobilize around a specific cause mm -hmm. and then ideally get uh, changes made to, like, legislation or, or something along those lines. Um, then you have advocates who are just vocal about um, what they believe or vocal about like the, you know, the needs of a specific group. And you have researchers and then you also have educators. And I would say that I'm, I've transitioned now into more of an education role as an activist. And my goal with my organization Organize is to help to educate activists and give them tools that help them to be more effective. Um, you know, it's one thing to understand or to know that systems of oppression exist. It's one thing to know that, you know, people in low income neighborhoods are, are, you know, met with all these diff disadvantages, you know, in all, in all these different ways. It's another thing to be able to build an organization that is effectively able to change that. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where a lot of 
groups have been struggling and it's not an easy thing. So I can't blame them for for not being able to make it to that next stage yeah but i think a lot of uh, it's it's like businesses you know uh, what is it 99 percent of businesses fail yeah probably 99.999 percent <laughs> of nonprofits yeah. or fail yeah. um and so you know and and i think nonprofits and social justice groups are really the key to to changing the world yeah.